There we go. Well, we'll wait another minute or two. We've got a small group here today. <laughs> yeah, right. People lost that hour, or they're going to come thinking they're going to Sunday school at 10 o'clock, and voila, they'll be going to church. Kathy's on the screen, and Kevin's on the screen. They might normally be here. Kathleen and Glenn, I bet you're at the mountains. Bob will be coming. For half an hour. For half an hour now to do ushering in. And uh, who else? Marcy, I know, was probably not going to be here today. And uh, Howie, Aaron, Brenda. So... So I'm going to mute you guys just so you don't have to feel conscientious of, uh, you know, talking in your home. But even as I mute you, you'll be able to unmute yourself if you want to talk at any time. So no, that's not what I want. There we go. Okay. Here comes Pat. Hello, Pat. Okay. So I'm just going to. I need to start. I, you know, wish we were with him. I know. I loved your hymn that you had. Oh, added. that's it. That was so cute. I don't know where I, I came across that this week at one point, and I thought, wow, I people will enjoy that. that morning has broken. Morning. And it was about turning your clock. I saw it, but I never. Didn't know that. And I didn't know what music it would be, because I don't music. But I think I put in my email, oh, to the tune of morning has broken. Oh, yeah, I think I said that. You gotta catch it all, Esther. I got so much in those emails. You do, you do. <laughs> Too much. <laughs> they do, they go on. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Either way you've come on. So um, we're gonna look at Genesis chapter three today. Um, and I will um, should be able to show that on the screen. I'm gonna pray first and then I'll have it on the screen in case you guys at home don't I mean, I know you have a Bible and you can look at it, but you can follow along with us as we read. But um, let me pray. We come to you this morning, Heavenly Father, thankful and grateful for a new morning, a new day, a new Sunday to worship you, a new opportunity to come in this room and on virtually to, to look at your word and hear about the beginnings and the day, especially consider us as humans and that relationship we have with you broken, but eventually healed through Christ. May you just open our hearts and minds to your word today, loosen our tongues and our lips and our hearts to worship you, and let us find this a glorious day because we are with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, let me quick screen share. And um, those of you sitting here, is everybody okay, comfortable with reading? And we'll, if you don't mind, Levon, we'll start with you and we'll just read a paragraph at a time, just pass it on to the next person. What's the paragraph at? Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to, to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. 
and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man <laughs> said, The woman whom you gave to be with me gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall, eat, you shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. But the sweat of your face, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man named his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us knowing good and evil, and now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed a cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. I hope we're going to study this for about yeah. 10 weeks. Yeah. yeah, really? Maybe we should. You're probably right. We'll, we'll see how far we get today. Because it is, yeah. it's a see? kind of pinnacle piece of scripture. Um, from it, a lot of things have come historically in our understanding of our faith. So with that said, just start off with questions, comments, observations, anything you have that we can uh, possibly Touch on as we go along here. I thought it was funny that he blamed his wife right away. Yeah, I, I thought of kids immediately. <laughs> yeah. I didn't do it. Yeah. He made me do it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So the uh, initial reaction was blaming. Definitely. Yeah, that's interesting. And I was wondering about the snake because he said, going forth, you'll crawl on your belly. I wonder what the snake looked like before. Sure. I thought mm -hmm. it too. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I just saw a TV show that depicted the snake with arms and legs before he gave the fruit to Eve. Mm. Wow. What was the TV show? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. I've always thought of this as a coming of age story. Mm -hmm. In what way? Yeah. Elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when children grow up and they come of age, they suddenly become um, aware of things that they weren't mm -hmm. aware of when they were small. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's an interesting way to put it. And that, I mean, you're not. I've come across others that that's what what they say. In fact, kind of rabbinical schools, rabbi schools of thought will venture more to looking at this as that kind of evolution of, our, of humans in terms of moral responsibility. 
here's where morality comes into play. And I touched on this last week, mm -hmm. that once we eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, we become the players of what is right and wrong, good and evil. And that starts our concept of morality, which God didn't initial, initially, he, I always say God didn't intend that for us because we were not supposed to eat from that tree. But once we did, then everything starts. Well, and because they did eat from it, you know, and when uh, he said, and I guess he was talking to the cherubim, uh, you know, because they could live forever now, like we do. If they eat from the tree of life. Of life. Okay. They, would, they would live for, could live forever. All yeah. right, yeah. yeah. And actually, when they, when they banned them in the garden, they set it up so they could never get near that tree. Right. Yes, with the, with the yeah. Yeah, yeah that, he yeah. doesn't want them to get it, gain any more knowledge. What's that about? Well, any more life. Uh, uh, more, so it looks like, at least according to this account, the way it's considered is that there's only kind of two small steps between humans and, and God or divinity. And that is the knowledge of good and evil and immor immortality. Because he said, once you, if they eat from this, they'll surely become like us, like me. So we're going to keep them from getting that far. So go ahead. I always oh. thought it meant as soon as they eat it, they'll die. Yeah. Well, right, die. which is not what happened. Right, but it starts the process of death, which also makes the point that in some ways God did not introduce death. I mean, He did with that choice, but God didn't create us dying. Death started when we decided to eat from that tree of knowledge, which means that there's going to be introduced into everything this concept that things will end and die. Christine, you were initially he didn't forbid them. To eat the fruit of the tree of life. Mm, that's right. That was not, it was just a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. Right. That's a good observation. Two different trees. Two different trees. Okay. Two different trees. Well, let's look at a few things, kind of plowing through this a little bit. And I might try not to go all over the place, but uh, just some. Trying to throw out some interesting observations here that make some important points eventually. So let's, let's talk about the serpent for a little bit. Not only did he have arms or legs, <laughs> curious question, but depending on your translation, and again, our translation says that he was crafty. The serpent was the more crafty than any other wild animal. Um, some translations use the word cunning. Behind the word or the concept is really one of kind of just an, an, there was an intelligence to the serpent that wasn't like any of the other creatures. Um, but it's not, the thing about this whole story is, you know, we have equated the serpent with Satan, with the devil. And I'm not going to say no to that, but I'm going to say just put that aside for a moment because that's not stated here at all. Did you see that anywhere? No. And what we know up to this point, let's go back to chapters one and two. How did God view everything that he made? Good. Including all the creatures, any of them that are crawling or upright. Everything is good. The serpent is good. Cunning and crafty are kind of words that we sort of now equate with. But Jesus himself said we should be as cunning as serpents in Matthew 10, 16. So Jesus doesn't look at cunning as necessarily a, a fault or a sin or an evidence of evil at all. Now, with that said, Let's notice what it is that the serpent really does here. Um, trying to find that note that I had about this because it's kind of interesting. So let's pay attention to what the serpent actually said, first of all. So what did the serpent say? Go back to that in verse 
Well, verse 1. What did he ask them? Or ask Eve? Did God say you shall not eat from the tree of the garden? Okay. You shall not eat from any, yeah. from <laughs> any tree. Ooh. Any tree. In the garden. Okay? So, <clears throat> we said, did God say? Okay? So let's go back to, if you have your Bibles and maybe you don't, that's okay. I'll go back to it. In Genesis 2.16, what did God say? God said, command the man, you may freely eat of every tree. Of the garden. He does then go on to give an exception. But what he really said was, you may eat free of every tree. The serpent asked the question from a negative. Did God say, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? God didn't say that. He said, you may freely. It's kind of, glass is half empty or half full. God kind of comes at it from the positive and the permission. Satan introduces the, maybe God said it this way, and gets them to start thinking differently about what God might have said. Remember, that something is good so far in this account. So far in the first two and a half chapters, something is good based on what? What God said. What God said. That's really important. We'll keep coming back to that. Good is something that God says is good. No one, nothing else. And God said, it's good to eat from every tree. Again, yeah, just don't eat from that one tree, but every tree is free for you to eat from. So, just want to note how initially the serpent comes in there and gets them to kind of look at it differently. A little twist. That's all it takes for any of us. Was the serpent evil? Was the serpent sinful? Serpent just asked a question from a different angle, but that different angle kind of introduce things. Something else happens that's kind of interesting. Um, let's notice in my papers here. What's going to happen according to the serpent if they eat from this tree? What will happen? Well, on the ground. What's that? No. no. You won't die. You won't die. But also what's going to happen? You will be Your able eyes to die. will be open. Eyes will be open. You'll be like God. And You'll know good and evil. Okay? Let's look at those three things for a second. Particularly the first thing. Your eyes will be open. As Christine said, kind of a coming of an age thing. You're going to start to kind of see things. You're going to start to perceive things. You're going to start to to look at things, which all sounds very good. Except, up to this point, how is everything kind of perceived? And 
Just think about this for a second. What do we say about creation so far? How did God create? How did God create? Everything was created how? Did he do this? No, we said he did what? With the word. God spoke. God spoke and everything happened. That was good enough. It made everything. God was in a relationship with Adam and Eve, and they were themselves based on spoken word. Okay? What is the devil? What is the serpent? What is the serpent? See, I'm used to doing that too. What is the serpent say is going to happen if they eat? They're going to be able to start seeing. We're going to move from spoken word, which creates and which was good enough to now you guys are going to see. That doesn't mean they were walking around blind. But it does mean now your eyes will be open. You will be like God looking at everything. And now you're going to get an opportunity to determine. This is probably better translated determine. Because nobody knows, even today, no, this is a way to kind of look at this, and it may be a little controversial, but in essence, we as humans do not know good. Good, as we determine, is completely based on that. God determines good. We don't. So we never know good and evil. We determine. We assume, come up with ourselves, our own understanding. We assume everything is good, though. We like to assume everything is good. Oh, what do you mean? They're going to see evil, too. Well, again, has there been evil up to this point? No. Everything's been good. So where does this come from? It comes from humans trying to come up with their own determination of what is good. Right? And the minute you and I come up with what is good, there has to be a not good. It becomes this. But up to this point, did God ever say anything about this, about evil? So I'm pointing to things to you, Kathy, Mike, and Patty, and Kevin, that you probably can't see up on the screen. So um, evil is not something that God necessarily placed in the garden. It is a repercussion of Adam and Eve deciding to listen to the serpent. So was the serpent actually bad in the, in the beginning, or how did he get bad? We determined it. Well, how did he get bad? We determined he was bad. God never said he's bad. It's the serpent. But after our eyes were open, he was bad. And then God did make a judgment on the serpent. God did say, from now on, you're going to crawl on your belly. God did make a change to the serpent, although it's still, God still didn't say the serpent's bad. But now the serpent is always going to be at the heels of the human. There's going to be a problem now. But it still kind of all goes back to you. So let's, so we talk about this all as being the start of sin. Okay, again, a word that is not in the story anywhere, but it is our word, sin what this is all about. What did Adam and Eve, what did Adam and Eve do wrong? They listened to the serpent. Okay. They listened to the serpent. That's good. What did you say, Levon? Disobeyed. Disobeyed, which is usually our answer. They disobeyed because God eventually said you shouldn't eat from that tree, and they did. But I always like to go a little deeper. Why did they eat from the tree? So yes, they disobeyed, but where did the disobedience come from? 
came from they, they listened to somebody else. Okay? God says that they didn't listen to God. They listened to this other guy who said, if you do this, this will happen. Your eyes will be open. You'll be like God. You'll know good and evil. Okay? So, the sin is not so much that they disobeyed. And I think this is, this is a big thing that I've kind of come to that I will hang my hat on strongly. Sin is not that we disobey. Our disobedience comes from somewhere. Our decision to disobey comes from somewhere. And that decision to disobey comes from a decision, a choice between do I listen to God or do I listen to a twisting of God's word, a lie. Okay. Do I listen to God or do I listen to a lie? Do I believe God or do I believe a lie? To me, from this account, and basically from life experience, when we all think about it, it's long enough, sin is ultimately that I don't believe God. Not that I don't believe in God. That's atheism. That's not what I'm talking about. I don't believe God. Every morning, every incident, every circumstance, every, every day, I have a, a choice. Do I want to believe God who has spoken to me both through creation and then ultimately through Jesus? Do I believe what God says to me through that? Or I believe what serpents out there who are twisting it all around say to me? So from the very start, the introduction, so to speak, of sin has to do with who you're going to listen to, who you're going to believe. It, it's kind of a setup, though. I, I, I look at it setup. like it was a setup, mm. a little bit of a setup, because there was no evil. Everything was good in the garden. Right. So the setup is that God, and we talked about this, I think, the first week a little bit. So if God wants a relationship with us, so, okay, I'm going to back up one second, so I hope you're all following me along, because there's another interesting thing about the serpent. So again, going back to those first five verses, did God say you shall not eat from the tree in the garden? But the serpent said you will not die, for God knows that when your eyes are open, when you will be open, you will be like God. Now, Remember, because you were all here for this, remember the first week, chapter 1, we said the name for God is Elohim. And we said that's God looking over the whole universe. That was God, created all. Terrible thing. God, created all. Elohim. And then, chapter 2 calls him Lord God, which was Yahweh. Elohim is God over all the universe. Yahweh is God in relationship to us, caring about us, caring about the universe, but specifically caring about humanity. Because in chapter 2, that's where there's everything starts to get explained about the creation of Adam. Remember, we said the creation story in chapter 2 emphasizes the creation of the humans. And now starts to talk about Yahweh, God as relational. See, it's the serpent <laughs> refers to God as Elohim. The serpent does not talk about the relational God. The serpent says, did the big God out there tell you not to eat from any tree? And so the focus again went away from God being in a relationship, 
walking in the garden with you and Adam and, and enjoying, enjoying relationship, he doesn't talk about God in that way. He takes the mind off of that relational God. He says, look at the universe out there. It's all out there for you. So again, it's very similar to how we are enticed into the world stuff. People kind of come outside of, take us outside of this relationship with God and say, but yeah, there's a big world out there. Enjoy the big world out there. We keep wanting to say, but God tells me this. God says this. God determines this is good. And everybody else around us kind of says, yeah, that's one voice. Or sure, let, let me help you see how that, that can lead to all these other things that you haven't been doing or experiencing or considering. So God created us to be, created Adam and Eve, and then eventually us, to be in a relationship with him. The serpent tries to move us outside that relationship. Back to the setup. So if God wants to have a relationship with us, a relationship involves love, a loving relationship. We cannot have love without one thing. One thing we need to have love, or it won't be love. We talked about this. Otherwise, there'll be coercion. We need freedom. You can say you love somebody all you want, but if you got them locked up in a basement, that isn't love. Like I said, you can tell you tell us you love your kids all you want, but if all you keep doing is taking their hand from the stove, you're not letting them ever learn and freely choose and, and really understand, oh, now I know why my mom kept pushing my hand away. She loved it. But if mom just keeps pulling your hand away, that you never learn that that's hot. You don't really know what your mom's doing in the first place. Seems like she's just keeping you from something. By virtue of putting a choice in the garden, God is giving them freedom, not only to choose where to eat from, but to choose whether or not they want to believe God or believe a lie. If they believe God, they're entering into that love relationship. If they believe the lie, they're walking away from that love relationship. But God gives them that choice. So set up to set up to, to enhance love and get away from coercion or force or whatever other words you want to use. That makes sense. Other thoughts here that anybody would like to throw out? It's interesting, too, to note that in the, um, I'm trying not to kind of run to the New Testament and other things, but I do want to point this out because you're probably somewhat familiar with it. In 1 John chapter 2, 15 to 16, John describes the world, which we're supposed to kind of steer clear of. And he says the world involves. When, when Eve looks at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, after the serpent tells her, if you eat from it, your eyes will be open, you'll be like God, you'll know good and evil. It says, Eve saw that the tree was good for food. The tree was a delight to the eyes. And the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took and ate from it. Those three things. The tree was good for food. The tree was a delight to the eyes. The tree was to be desired to make one wise. In 1 John, John says, here's what, it's, here's what the world's trying to get you to do. The desires of the flesh, food was good. The desires of the eyes, the tree was a delight to the eyes. The pride of life, the tree will help make one wise. Right there was. These same enticements have always been there. They're all neutral, but the degree to which we put our trust in them or let someone twist around to us, they're how valuable they are or what they'll do for us 
contrary or counter to what God says. That's where the problem has always been. So she didn't actually see that the food was good to eat. She believed the serpent. Yes, that's a good point. She believed the serpent. He was saying, there's nothing wrong with this. Because you can't see when something's good for you. So she had at, at that point, she 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 could see. She could see that it looks nice, but she couldn't right. see that it would make her smart or right. that it would. And then, and she's still going by what God says, which is everything's good. He, he just says don't eat for that. He never said the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is rotten fruit. He never said it's bad. They knew everything around them was good according to God. So that tree was still the fruit was still good because God said it was good. God just said, don't eat it. But she at least looked at it and said, well, it still looks good. You know, it's still, I can still see it's good. And this serpent guy told me it's all right. And it's a delight to my eyes. I'm pleased by looking at it, just like I am everything else around here. And to top it off, he says, if I eat from it, I'm going to be really wise. I'm going to be smart. So that led to eating it. Once that was eaten, again, I think this is the real kind of point of this, is once that's eaten, their eyes were open. Now, what's the first thing that they noticed? They were naked. And God says to them, when God comes upon them finally, after they've hid themselves, Adam says, God says, why, why are you hiding? What does Adam say? Because we were naked. God says, who told you you were naked? Who made that judgment? Because God never made that judgment. They apparently have been walking around naked. In fact, at the end of chapter 2, the description of Adam and Eve is this. They were Naked and not ashamed. We were created to be naked and not ashamed. And naked in this case, not just meaning we don't have clothes on. Just we are who we are. Because we're good. As God made us, we're fine. What immediately gets tainted is the moment... We get to start determining good and evil is we start to say your nakedness is not good. You better hide yourself from each other, from God. Okay. And then kind of add to the hiding and the covering by starting to blame each other. So again, remember, they were in the garden with God, with each other. Everybody was fine, hunky-dory, naked, not ashamed. They enjoyed themselves. They enjoyed each other. They enjoyed all the goodness. But once they decided to believe someone other than God, to think that there's still something that they don't have, this whole garden, remember last time we said the area was like, you know, it's like the Amazon Basin. It's huge. You got all of this. Two trees to stay away from, but everything. What they were led to believe was we still don't have it all. We still don't have enough. We should be able to get from these trees too. The moment they believed that, they then started to determine good and evil. They then started to determine what is right and wrong. And again, let's just think about human relationships. Pretty much the, the foundation of any conflict, any problem, any disturbance amongst us relationally goes back to we're each determining our own sense of good or evil. And not, even, not just in a big moral sense, but just in what we are comfortable with, you know, so that's another thing. There may not be a good or an evil to certain perspectives we have, certain preferences we hold, but we will treat them like that and treat others who don't have the same preferences or, or 
ideas as bad, or at least not us, and we put ourselves at odds. So there's where it all started. It all comes down to do I believe God when he says, I've given you everything you need. It's all good. It's all for you. And, and if you eat from this one place here, you're going to die. And that, that's, that's going to be a problem. So don't eat from it. They choose to believe the serpent who says, you're not going to die. You're going to be like God. And you're going to be wise. And from then on, we as humans kind of live by sight instead of listening to the word of God. So we're going to look at our lives, we're going to look at everything around us, and we're going to make our judgments primarily based on that, as opposed to, well, here's what God says. But look at this. See this. I perceive it this way. I interpret it this way. This was my life experience. Again, I'm not going to say all those things are bad. I'm just going to say we're going to use those as the basis for how we live our life versus what God says. So judgments and, and perspectives and all that become what we use to guide and gauge our life and what we use to evaluate our lives and the lives of people around us instead of what God says. One, one more point there, just to kind of broaden that. So again, if in the beginning, and as far as we know, God does, hasn't necessarily changed his mind in some respects. What he created in us is good. We've just been the ones who painted that understanding of each other. So if we listen completely to God, we try to stop looking at each other with all the stuff that we put on top of each other, all the stereotypes and the prejudices and, and judgments and expectations and all that, and just look at you and say, you know, I'm going to love you as you are, which is what God, again, affirmed for the cause of Christ who died for the whole world and didn't make us become something different in order to die for us. So that's kind of what's happened, I think, in, in the eating of the fruit part of this whole thing. Thoughts? Anything from the, the virtual gallery there? So did God kill an animal to get the skin, or did he just create it? Mm. Mm. That's a fair question, and I don't know the answer to <laughs> Good question. Very good question. Right, let me just come back to that. Because one other interesting thing before we get to that part of the story. Let's go back to naked for a second. Interestingly, the word naked in the Hebrew is the same rooted word as crafted. It's in my footnotes. <laughs> oh, yep. wow. So, what's interesting is, in some ways you could read that as Adam and Eve saw themselves as naked and hid themselves, but they also saw themselves as, as a serpent. Or as a serpent. Cunning, crafty, all that. They saw themselves as the one who kind of twists Oh, after, God's after they ate. After they ate, when they realized they were naked, mm -hmm. what they realized is, yeah, I don't have any clothes on, but they also realized, I'm, I'm just now a twister of God, too. Not in those words, but because I Because they thought they could sneak it without him knowing. Very possible, yeah. It's just interesting to note those words are the same. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of stuff is sometimes escapes us and it's nice to have study bibles where it gives you some of that information in it because in our english we just don't we don't have the word pictures that sometimes other languages like hebrew does mm -hmm. and so we kind of miss some of those sort of things 
Um, so that first response as well of Adam and Eve to hide also is the introduction of something else that was not in this story before. Again, the word is not there, but what is there? It was there, actually. Again, God created them, and at the end of the account, right before the serpent comes on the scene, the assessment is they were naked and not ashamed. They eat, eyes open, naked, and now shame comes into the story. Shame, which is probably one of the strongest emotions that drives humans than anything else. From the start with Adam and Eve, we all have been very DNA programmed, genetically, whatever. This, is it, uh, I'm looking for a P word, I forget. Well, we have the propensity towards shame at all times. We're always looking down on ourselves. We're always looking down on others. That's what shame really kind of means. Right? So that wasn't in the origins. God didn't create us with shame. Shame is what we experience as a result of being caught up in all the good and bad, good and evil, determination stuff. It comes out of that. It doesn't come out of God. God does not shame us. God will hold us guilty for things. Guilt's a different word. Guilt is what God went through later uh, or, or addressed later. They were guilty. They had done something you know, contrary to what God said to do. So there is a guilt. There is a, a gulf, which is what the word guilt really means, between two parties that they created by, here's God, we're together, and now I'm going to do this, which you told me we shouldn't do here, so I'm going to do it. So now I've created a gap. And God addresses that guilt. And he says there's consequences to that guilt. And he begins to talk about this, and I think this, we'll kind of stop and pick that up next time. But he starts to talk about those consequences to the guilt. But God does not shame them. God does not say... God never then says, so you guys are evil, you guys are bad. He does remove them from that garden. Okay, So there is movement in that regard, but God is not shaming them. Shame is kind of what we put on each other. You know, when God said, you will surely die, uh, really they did. They died to what they were. Exactly. Exactly. That's all. It's all. Death is a big ball, and it's just like you said, Esther. You know, we, it's easy to look at this and go, oh, "They were going to drop over the minute they ate." Because we only sometimes we just limit death to the six feet under end of life kind of thing. But death here is really that just that introduction of you're going to, you're not going to enjoy, you're not going to be in this anymore. This is real life right here. This, this garden in the goodness of God as God created it. And once you venture out on your own, that that's gonna that relationship is dying. No. My note said by causing the woman to God doubt God's word, Satan brought evil into the world. So where did Satan come from? <laughs> that's why he was a fallen angel. <laughs> yeah, well, we can, we'll, we'll pick that up next time if you want to. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not saying Satan's not here. Don't get me wrong. But yeah, we Satan's a big ball of wax too. It's not just oh he was that serpent there. Um, I do believe that word Satan means the, the Satan, word Satan means deceiver. So there is a sense of deception, obviously, that this serpent did. He kind of twisted the words around. So. Satan's job has always been, as I see it scripturally, to try and, again, shame us and believe the shame rather than believe 
God's word. So Satan is always at work when God says, I created you good and I love you and I value you and I send my son to die for you and you're that important and worth it to me. Whenever we entertain something less than that, we can guarantee that the serpent, Satan, the devil, whatever, is introducing something in our life to get us to believe something other than what God said. And that means, again, we're destined into death of something in our life at that point. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So we have a little couple of time to get up to <laughs> worship. I think we will pick up the rest of this chapter three and, and maybe start venturing into uh, the next chapter. And as you know, we only have so many weeks of this. I mean, not that we can't continue, but uh, I didn't know it was a big story that covers a bunch of chapters. So we're not going to we'll hit the highlights of Noah, most likely. So we'll get there. All right. Thank you all. I'm grateful that you are a minister, mm -hmm. and especially with us, uh, rather than a college professor, which you definitely could be, because then you'd be working with immature minds. <laughs> 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 Not that ours are mature, but at least, you know, we're, you know, it, it, it's so meaningful now. Well, this is, I, I enjoyed, I, I've always enjoyed reading and studying scripture for my sermons. And so, um, and, I, and I do a lot of reading and really thinking about it. I, I That's always amazing. felt like I, I'm willing to enter into scripture with a bit of an open mind and not just, you know, just for instance, even like, I'm, I'm not a person who wanted to right away say, well, the serpent was Satan. I'm going to read what the passage says. Let's start there and try. And, and sometimes that's opened up scripture to me in a, in a bigger way. Sure, and and uh, I enjoy being able to kind of get people to think about it that way too. And I just know most of us aren't reading our Bibles in the first place. And that's not a knock. That's just a reality. I mean, if I, if I wasn't a pastor, I don't know if I'd be reading it as consistently and often as I, I think would be helpful and would be good. Um, but I'm glad I do, and I'm, I like to be able to talk to other people about it and get them to think about it. So. Did you have to take and learn the Hebrew to, to know these other words? No, I did take some Hebrew. I, didn't, I, I took a lot more Greek So for the New Testament. Mm -hmm. I didn't get a lot of Hebrew. But, I mean, I read a lot of writers, scholars, theologians, stuff who, who certainly have and kind of open that door up for me. But I also know how to use a exhaustive concordance, as it call, it's called, which has all the words and the Hebrew and tells you what it means in Hebrew. And I, I've learned how to use those very well. So, yeah. so anyway, I'm glad you guys come. I hope you enjoy it. No judgment, people. No, exactly. <laughs> Remember when you're thinking about things being good or bad? Mm, be careful. <laughs> yes, Dad. Be careful. All right. Um, Which technically means spoiled and rotten. And if you put them together, then you're talking about what little kids. Thank you.